Very good afternoon. I'm Aisha, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Kindly of know that this webinar will be recorded. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Actress Cell Therapy Lecture Series. Today's lecture by our distinguished speaker, Dr. Ling Fu Ping, focuses on stem cell therapy for chronic skin wounds. Dr. Ling Fu Ping holds the Bachelor and Master of Nursing degrees from the University of Sydney, Australia, and completed her PhD in medicine at the Young Lin School of Medicine in the US. Specializing in the field of skin and wound studies, her doctoral research focuses on diabetic wound healing. She utilizes her clinical, academic, and research knowledge and experience to transform the delivery of wound prevention and treatment interventions through translation of high-quality clinical research and innovation activities. Her goal is to develop effective therapeutic strategies for the treatment of chronic wounds. Before we get started, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A window. Dr. Lim Fui will address these questions after the presentation. And now without further ado, let's welcome our speaker, Dr. Lim, please. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, joining these sessions uh, so that we could uh, um, uh, probably discuss later about this particular uh, intervention that we are using for diabetic patients. Okay, I'll share my screen. Uh, and thanks a lot, Aisha, for the kind introduction. Um, Aisha, could I just check that you are looking at the full screen? we can see a screen full screen okay yes, yep. full, screen. full screen right uh Aisha sorry yes, that's right. okay yeah okay so the topic for my presentation is on uh stem cell therapy for chronic skin wounds uh, from bench to bedside so my team uh comprises uh, Professor Fan uh Prof Jackie Prof Elvin as well as Prof Wilson Okay, so uh, the team focused on uh, preclinical in vivo. So we were working on uh, stem cells on pig model as well as uh, mice model. And we have concluded that part and currently are trying to translate that to clinical. And I can share a few. We don't have much data on the clinical because it's in progress. But uh, I will share a little bit of uh, what we do on the uh, diabetic patients at Sengkang Hospital and also in home setting. So this is what I'll be sharing with us later. Okay, so type of wounds, uh, we know that there's acute and chronic wounds. For acute wound, we are not too worried because uh, uh, acute wound would basically self-heal. We, base, we just need to take care that, make sure that the acute wound is not infected. Uh, chronic wound is a great uh, challenge for all of us, uh, especially diabetic foot ulcers. Is also because the uh, number of patients uh, having diabetes is uh, escalating very quickly. And with that, we also see more and more uh, patients having diabetic foot ulcers in the clinical setting. Yeah, uh, other type of chronic wounds can consist of, you know, arterial or venous leg ulcers as well as pressure injury. Yeah, so uh, my research team were focusing on um, diabetic foot ulcerations. Okay, what we know from uh, literatures is that, you know, and, uh, and also uh, what we notice in clinical area is that for uh, diabetic ulcers, they seems to be in an inflammatory state all the time. Uh, and we all know that for wound healing, it would go through inflammation uh, probably for about seven days. Uh, yep, and then it will progress to proliferation state and then will be remodeling. And that is basically a normal wound healing process. Unfortunately for chronic wounds, they tend to uh, be stagnant in the state, which is the inflammatory state. So even when we see these patients in clinical, uh, we notice that, you know, a lot of time, uh, you know, the wound is like constant inflammation and that sort of like, you know, uh, impeded the progress of healing from inflammatory to proliferation. And in the inflammatory process, uh, when they are revolving in the inflammatory process, times will come by, by the, there is a higher chance of infection. And during the infection, that's the time that we get most worried because they're at risk of amputation. Okay, so some of the, uh, in fact, diabetic foot ulcer seems like, you know, to a lot of people, it's just a wound, you know, so uh, not much attention has been put onto diabetic wounds for many, many years. 
Okay, what we realize is that you know it's actually a silent endemic. There is a lot of uh, uh, implications on unhealed wound, especially infected wound, and progressively will lead to amputations. Uh, so that is actually uh, a serious matter. Okay, so uh, there is definitely you know um, a very strong connection between diabetes and food ulcerations. Uh, patient with diabetes, uh, the food get uh, ulcers and then it doesn't heal. So that is actually always a, a risk factor for you know, infection and then to amputation. Okay, and um, US data, every 30 seconds, one limb is lost through amputation. And 86% of this amputation uh, is associated with diabetes, okay? Uh, and even um, again, uh, US data, um, age-adjusted diabetes related uh, lower extremities amputation from 2009 to 2015, uh, minor amputation. Uh, there is actually from 2009 to 2015, uh, in fact that there is actually a 62% increase in minor amputation and major amputation, there is an increase of 29%. So you can see that it basically just signal to us that, you know, uh, um, we might not have a very definite or very effective uh, strategy to manage this wound that it can actually uh, that can lead it to actually progression of amputation. Okay, so uh, there is quite a lot of work that need to be done in this aspect. Okay, uh, we also see that the British uh, UK data it shows that similar the prevalence of new chronic diabetic foot ulcers increased from twenty point seven to thirty three. 0.1 per 1,000 people also is on the increasing trend and uptrending uh, uh, pattern, okay? And uh, World Health Organization, they also recognize that, you know, 15 to 20% of diabetic patients develop DFU and uh, with 271 million more people will have diabetes by 2045. So definitely the DFU uh, occurrence would increase as well. Okay, so our Ministry of uh, Health in 2016, uh, Mr. Gan, he's he, you know, in his um, in his uh, speech, he actually mentioned that you know Singapore has one of the highest rate of lower extremity amputation in the world. We basically perform four amputation procedure a day, so that is actually uh, spoken at a speech by uh, our Ministry of Health. Our Minister of Health, uh, Mr. Gan. Yeah, so that actually um, really reflect that, you know, there is an issues and we haven't really find effective ways to manage this wound, to accelerate the closure and uh, to prevent limb amputation. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, and uh, what by what Mr. Gan had mentioned, and also the National Healthcare Group, they in the document they also put that, you know, one of the world's highest for uh, diabetic related leg amputation. Okay, so uh, if you look at 2008, a uh, minor amputation, uh, 99.5 in 100,000. Um, uh, that's major amputation, sorry. Uh, yeah, for minor amputation, it's actually 163.6 in 100,000. So that's actually a lot of uh, amputation being performed. Yeah, age and sex uh, standardized amputation rate in 2017. You can see that we have a little bit of uh, decrease in terms of major amputation and major amputation would indicate loss of limb like the lower limb below knee amputation so uh, it's basically loss of limb uh, below knee level uh, minor amputation could be toe amputation could be ray amputation four foot amputations yeah so that is uh, increase minor amputation from 2008 to 2017 so local data shows that we have a bit of success in preventing major amputation which is below knee or above knee amputation but uh, we are still very high in terms of minor amputation, which is like, um, yeah, uh, there's an increase, in fact, in the minor amputation. So we perform less major amputation, but we have a lot of minor amputation that's been done, which is toe amputation, four foot amputation. So this amputation would affect patients' life because they actually uh, lost balance when you don't have your, let's say you lost one of your large toe, your big toe, or you lost the four foot of your leg, that can actually uh, affect amputation. A lot of these patients were lost job, and following by lost job, they also decrease mobility, and that result to them having a sedentary life, and um, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, very little uh, mobility or ambulation, and that can lead to other causes of clinical problems in this patient. Okay, so this is Singapore as well, uh, done by Sosui Hawk uh, um, uh, data. So uh, yeah, you can see the time to you know uh, uh, diabetes-related lower extremity complications. So generally. 
uh, if you look at the orange uh, box up area, okay, um, for diabetic patient, yeah, um, about 13.25% will develop diabetic related lower extremities complication. And uh, fortunately, uh, 942 will remain as DLLEC with no amputation uh, performed on them. Okay, but they are also a group that basically is quite uh, yeah, a lot of them actually, from what I see in clinical, they lost job because of this, uh, having a wound on the leg itself, you know, they sort of like, you know, reduce our mobility and that affect their work, okay. Uh, but 5.8% um, actually progress to amputation, okay. So this is actually a research done in uh, the uh, central side of Singapore, which is just one of the cluster, Tan Tok Seng, Khu Teck Port area. Okay, uh, can you imagine if this number uh, is multiplied by three? Because we haven't have data from the NUH side as well as SGH side, the cluster, the East cluster and the West cluster, we uh, is not included into this study. So it's just a central cluster itself. Already the number is actually quite uh, huge. Okay, uh, so for um, yep, for five point eight percent of them, um, yeah, by the time they actually reach amputation is two point three months from. DLLEC, DL, uh, DRLEC, which is diabetic related lower extremity complication. So, in summary, you can see that you know, uh, patients with diabetes, yeah, um, they can have uh, uh, diabetic related lower extremity complication uh, in uh, about 10.9 months uh, uh, from the you know, progress time. And then from diabetic related lower extremity complications to amputation is about 2.3 months. So it's actually quite quick. So if we didn't arrest the problem fast enough, the progress of deterioration would be quite uh, quick. And yeah, so so that's the reason why it's important to actually, when there is a wound occurring in the patient with diabetic, we have to address it quick. We have to actually try to accelerate the closure to prevent them from having diabetic related lower extremity complication, which then lead to amputation. Okay, uh, why amputation is not good? We all know that, you know, uh, uh, DFU with amputation, um, half of them, almost half of them, you look at the circle here, let me see whether I can active, uh, get my, okay, yeah, you can see the, um, there's a pointer, okay, you can see uh, this DFU with amputation, more than half of them have two years survival, but also like, you know, uh, about half, half, okay, so 50% will have more than two years survival, and 50% actually have uh, less than two years survival, yeah, because of the mo mobility, a lot of them after amputation, they will be uh, wheelchair bound, or some of them will be big bound, and that lead to a lot of a lot of uh, problems that, you know, we might not recognize, uh, but generally it lead to other conditions, and then you will see them having a pressure injury developing, and then with that, you know, uh, the, uh, yeah, their survival rate is actually very less than two years survival, half of them, okay. For overall DFU, um, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, not talking about amputation, but just having diabetic foot ulcerations, 56% of them have more than five years survival rate and 44% have less than five years survival rate. Again, it shows that you know it is actually a huge problem that we might not have um, put in enough attention to address the issue. Okay, so for my research team, what we did is that we were using uh, umbilical cord. So umbilical cord, uh, mesenchymal stem cells originated or extracted from the umbilical cord. Prof Fan's team, uh, some of you might know uh, Professor Fan. So he's, uh, his lab, lab, we basically extract the, um, uh, the stem cells from the MSC, which is mesenchymal stem cells from the umbilical cord. Okay, so that's what we use. Okay, so we were trying to study the efficacy of it. So the first thing that we are trying to do is to see whether cord lining MSC will contribute to the healing of full thickness dermal wound in hyperglycemic induced uh, animal model. So we use two animal model. The first one is uh, DBDB murin model and the second one is hyperglycemic induced pig model. Okay, so uh, um, if you look at whether this animal model are very, very close to human, it's actually not really because uh, the DBDB murine model is actually a genetic diabetic, uh, uh, yeah, whereas this pig model, we induce the hyperglycemia, but when you come to animal study, we cannot like hold it for 10 years kind of thing, right, because, uh, but when you talk about chronic wound, usually it would require, you know, uh, you, um, the wound itself, the age the age of the wound or the age of the defect is usually about you know uh, maybe six years seven years but there's no way that we can actually uh, create a chronic wound it's difficult to create a chronic wound in animal models because uh, funding wise is an issue we will not be able to keep uh, or we cannot like induce diabetic on this 
pick and then keep them for six months, seven months before we uh, observe any tissue changes and then proceed with our intervention. So this one, in a way, is actually quite acute. It's not really very, very difficult to create a chronic wounds in the animal model. So that's one of the limitations that we face. Yeah. The second thing that we were hoping to achieve was to actually uh, look at, study some of the mechanism, which is also challenging when we do it on animal models because it's a whole organism. Yeah, very different from... Um, uh, in uh, lab work whereby you can control the situation, but the animal itself, animal one, animal two, animal three, they're all very different to start off with in terms of the compositions and in terms of their health. Could uh, As far as possible, we try to uh, standardize that, but there is still difference between animal one and animal two. So it's actually difficult uh, when we uh, test it on animal. But we were trying to see the mechanic uh, by looking at the pro-inflammatory markers and the anti-inflammatory markers from the blood. La. So when we did the study, we, we draw blood and then we try to study the inflammatory markers, uh, see whether uh, we hoping that the uh, treated animal would have a, um, there will be a down regulation of pro-inflammatory marker and up regulation of anti-inflammatory marker. So that's what we're trying to uh, achieve. And then um, for the third thing that we're trying to do, we also try to look at the collagen and whether there's an improved collagen architecture in the treated animals. Reason being that uh, in clinical itself, when we look at diabetic wounds, they always break down very easily. So uh, the, um, the what's it called? The uh, recurrence rate is very high. So even we manage to treat one wound and if we were to, um, you know, you, you, there's a lot of recurrence means after a few months, you will see them having another wound or that same wound will break down again. So they basically reflect that they have very poor collagen structure that that wound itself, once there's a wound, the tissue is very, very weak. Uh, they don't uh, form very strong tissues, very solid tissue. And these wounds get break down again and again and again. So, uh, so that's why uh, the third aim that we are trying to do is to see whether uh, cord lining MSC can improve the structure of collagen because of the regeneration properties in uh, stem cells. We're hoping that it will actually regenerate the collagen and make it a bit stronger. And with that, it would prevent the uh, recurrence uh, that we face in the clinical side as well. Okay, uh, this look uh, come. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but, but I just give a summary of what we did. Lah. But basically, we have three groups. Okay, one group of mice receive intraperitoneal, means the mode of uh, delivery, the mode of the stem cell delivery will be through the intraperitoneal site. Okay, so that is the, from what you see here is actually the orange uh, line here. Okay, so uh, every week uh, from operation day to every week, we would actually, means the stem cell itself is injected into the intra, intraperitoneal site on a weekly basis. Okay, so week one, week two, week three, okay, I will inject and then of course we will do wound measurement when we inject the, uh, before we inject, we will see the, we will track the rec uh, recovery rate. Uh, okay, so that's the first group. Okay, and the second group itself is actually the, the mode of delivery will be through the topical site, means we actually put the stem cells on the topical wound. Uh, why this is important is because uh, for translation purpose, uh, it's very, very difficult to get the stem cells injected into a person. Uh, it will go through a lot of, you know, uh, uh, regulation requirement. Topical, uh, generally, people are more accept, uh, able to accept it a bit more. So this topical will become an important, uh, uh, um, a, a, a important findings for us to translate to practice. Lah, okay, because uh, intraperitoneal will take a long time. So our intraperitoneal was just trying to see whether to, actually is actually a way to uh, gauge how safe uh, stem cells is to the um, animals because if you can inject into the body intra system and intra peritoneal uh, and does not cause any death to the animal then it is actually an indication that it should be safe yeah so uh, so our experiment group for topical is more for us to actually we see it as having the largest potential to translate uh, because uh, it's easier to translate uh, a topical mode of delivery than to actually uh, um, try to go through and say, okay, we're going to inject the stem cells into the peritoneum of a person. So it's very, very difficult to translate that. Okay, so of course our control group um, basically also receive intraperitoneal, but uh, it's basically just a, a sham media. Like, there's no stem cells in this media. And then the topical side also uh, we apply uh the stem cells on it oh no sorry to uh, apply the uh, sham media uh, the the media in onto it with no stem cells so that's the control group that we did 
Okay, so uh, time series, just some uh, idea on how we actually, you know, uh, of course, we remove all the hair, okay, and then we uh, we still uh, use the hair removal cream to make sure that all the hair are fully removed, and then uh, we plot two uh, wounds, uh, one centimeter or 10 millimeter times 10 milliliter, uh, 10 millimeter. So, uh, so it's basically one times one centimeter wound onto the animal uh, skin. So it's actually a full skin remover, which include the uh, epidermis and the dermis. La. It's a full skin remover. So that is actually what we did. Okay, and then of course we, uh, yep, you cut out and then that is actually the wound that's created. Okay, uh, for animal, um, for uh, the, because there's no animal, I mean, in the in the wow area, there's no there's no um, hospital for animal. The animal won't like go to the hospital to seek treatment. So, so a, a very natural process that we see, the wound get contracted almost very quickly so it would actually in uh, but that's not happening in human so the difference between animal and human is that for animal what we notice is that they will self-contract the skin will actually self-contract so it's a way to help the animals who are in the living in the forest living in the you know in the in uh with with, with uh, they, they won't go and seek help so this like uh, this skin itself will actually contract quite quickly so that's what we observe and that is not uh, close to human skin because human skin doesn't contract so quickly human skin uh, we regenerate let's say there's a, let's say there's a loss of tissue loss of uh, epidermis and dermis it will regenerate outward and then it will contract yeah it would uh, the epithelize so the mode of recovery is very different so in order for us to show that there is no contraction because contraction of skin doesn't happen in human. It, uh, humans healing go by granulation and then epithelization. Yeah, so we actually put, you can see in uh, picture G here, we actually put a spleen. Yeah, this spleen uh, is to actually uh, disallow or slow down the contraction because we wanted to show granulation and epithelization. So that's the reason why we put on a spleen here. Okay, then of course the dressing is quite straightforward. We put a non-adhering dressing, then we put a gauze, and then we bow, uh, use the Corban uh, self uh, adherence to actually wrap up. Okay, then one week later, we'll see these mice, we'll do the measurement of the wound, and then do the treatment either through intraperitoneal or through topical application. Okay, so this is how, for intraperitoneal, this is how we inject. Like we uh, hold the mice and then we inject into the intraperitoneal site. Okay. So for uh, the larger animal model is quite similar. Uh, we but this large animal they were first they come in healthy. They we induce uh, STZ to actually destroy the uh, pancreas cells so that this uh, pancreas would not be able to uh, release uh, secrete insulin and that actually caused the uh, pig to be um di uh, to be having very high sugar level. Okay, so we actually wait for 42 days. Uh, that's the reason, that's the thing that I say that we couldn't quite create a chronic wound because it, chronic wound take months, right, to actually have that kind of model. So, but we waited for two days because based on uh, uh, articles that we read, there is some in uh, other animal study, pig study, they do see some structural changes after 42 days, after STZ induction, means they see some loosening of the collagen, the, the, um, the skin, density, like, you know, uh, the quality of the skin actually um, start to deteriorate after, uh, uh, at about day 40, day 42, post STZ induction. So based on the literature that we have, we waited for 42 days, and then we tested the skin to make sure that there is some structural changes. And then with that, we create a wound and we start the intervention. Okay, so the, um, the wound is created 45 days um, after STZ presuming the chronic phase like, you know, to create a wound that have some uh, uh, tissue structure changes. Okay, and then with that, every week we will be uh, um, instilling the treatment. Okay, so of course there's again three group. One is topical, one is intraperitoneal, and one is our control group. Okay, and every week we will take one, two, three, four, five tissues for uh, different type of staining. So the blue one, let's see here, we will use it for uh, MT staining, okay, uh, Mason trichrome to look at the collagen structure. Then uh, uh, one of the tissue will be sent for TEM to also look at the quality of the skin. And then one tissue will be sent for H&E and then two tissue will be sent for IF staining for all the markers that we hope to study. Okay, so so that's what we did for uh, this, this, uh, this uh, pig study. It is how we induce the STZ into the animal to uh, create the um, the 
the uh, hyperglycemic state in the animal. Mm. Okay, so it was successful. Of course, the STZ, uh, before it was like uh, the sugar levels ranging from 4.4 millimole to 5.8. But after STZ, we can see that you know, this animal uh, uh, blood glucose level, fasting blood glucose level went up all the way to 19.5 and 26 point, uh, to 26 millimole per liter. So indicating that the STZ did destroy the cells in the pancreas and lead to um, no insulin production and that caused the pig to be having very high sugar level. So that was a, in a way a successful uh, model for hyperglycemic pig. Okay, so we did fairly similar thing, uh, but this time of course the, uh, it's a larger animal. So our dimension for the wound also has increased. It's a five and five centimeter. Okay, so we keep the rest intact for wound measurement. Only L2 itself, uh, a left side, the center wound was used for biopsy because if we keep uh, punching the uh, L3, L1, R1, R2, R3, that's difficult for us to actually look at the uh, healing process. Yeah, because uh, the wound is the wound itself is no natural healing because we keep punching it and we keep causing injury so for l1 uh left side um uh, the first wound and the left side the last wound we did not do any puncture okay right side uh, wound one wound two wound three also we keep it uh keep it uh, pure there is no disturbance in the healing process yeah so the biopsy was all taken from our left two uh left side wound uh, number two Okay, so this is how we remove. It's again very similar to the mice model. We remove the entire, it's a full thickness skin remover. Okay, so, uh, yep, so that's what we did. Um, yep, okay, so that's how we remove the skin. Okay, then we dress it. Uh, yeah, we we put, um, yeah, so uh, this is topical for topical. From uh, POD0 to POD7, we actually create a crater for us to put the uh, stem cells topical stem cells onto this crater and then we use a um, uh, firm dressing to actually close it up to disallow the um, the stem cells to actually leak out okay but when from uh, POD 14 onwards when the wound reach up to the uh, uh, skin surface layer we don't need to create that crater anymore uh, what we do is that we did a direct application and then the dressing technique is the same is basically a non-adherent dressing as a primary dressing and then the secondary dressing is basically just gauze and then you know we use GAMG and then we yeah we just uh, yeah just uh, use cotton and then we wrap up and yep so that's how we dress the wound and then we even have a uh, uh, a swine co jacket coat to actually because this animal move a lot so and we uh, see them we see them once a week and therefore we uh, try to keep the wound um, intact for one whole week okay this intraperitoneal uh, that's how we actually inject the stem cells i think it's about 25 mils yep was administered through the intraperitoneal route using an 18 gauge needle and 30 uh, mil syringe Okay, and then uh, it's ultrasound guided. Uh, so we, as we can see this uh, white probe here is basically the ultrasound. And then you can see the needle here. Uh, I think you all can see. Yeah, so you can see the needle enter into the intraperitoneal and we inject. These are all the stem cells that we inject in. You can see it actually being inflated and the stem cells remain there. So this is actually the um, intraperitoneal road that we, uh, we use. So it's guided by ultrasound to make sure that the site of um, is actually what, where we wanted the, the stem cells to be. So the uh, stem cells that's injected to the intraperitoneal site is basically uh, systemic. Yeah, it would actually go through the systemic route, whereas the topical one is basically just on top of the wound. And then, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, it's the same thing. We are hoping that the topical will be for application purpose. And our intraperitoneal, we use it more to prove that it's actually safe because we actually inject it into the animal's body system and we did not have any animal that actually uh, passed on due to this particular intervention. So, uh, so all the animals stay true and they did not have any, uh, um, uh, any death occurring from the MSC injection. Okay, for um, healing, uh, uh, the healing itself, okay, um, this is DBDB uh, mice model. So the DBDB mice model, um, we see that the CLMSC topical and CLMSC IP, not much of different, okay? So it's actually CLMSC uh, 
uh, topical is represented by the blue line and then the orange line is CLMSC IP, okay? The gray one is actually the control. So we start to see uh, that the wound size is actually uh, significantly different from day seven onwards. Okay, so day seven, we start to see that the topical and the IP uh, intraperitoneal has a, a smaller, um, uh, the, the percentage of closure is actually higher compared to the control. Okay, and then of course 14 and then 21. So it's quite, um, yeah, so you can actually see that, you know, in uh, post-op day 14 and post-op day 21, the control group is still, the wound is not healed, but where else for uh, both, you know, uh, topical and intraperitoneal, the, the wound actually healed by 21 days. Yeah, so diabetic wounds for pigs is said to be about, the healing time is about uh, 40 days, la, about 40 days. And uh, a normal non-diabetic uh, mice study uh, in some papers, usually for normal non-diabetic, is usually the closure will happen about uh, 21, uh, 14 to 21 days. So you can see that the stem cells itself potentially can uh, revert the diabetic um, wounds healing to be a normal wound healing timeline. Uh, yeah, because uh, we see in our study, even 21 days, the wound actually uh, achieve full appetalization or full closure already. This is common in the, um, in the um, uh, non-diabetic, means normal, healthy mice. Okay, and our study also showed that for control, you can see that it's really about diabetic, yeah, the, it's a, a prolonged healing time. Okay, for um for pig, see this is actually the pig model. Okay, this is the data that we see from the pig model. We use uh, of course we use different, but for presentation I just use linear wound advancement as a measurement of healing efficacy. Yeah, because linear wound advancement is uh, um is actually one of the most accurate way of measuring how many um how much the wound has progressed on a weekly basis. Okay, we start to see we see topical itself. From day seven, really, we see that you know, uh, it actually accelerate faster from day seven. Where else for IP intraperitoneal, it take a longer time to uh, start to see the effect. Yeah, so you can see from uh, uh, up day to day seven. If you look at my uh, my pointer here, yeah, we already see you know there is actually uh, quite good closure progress. Really, quite good linear advancement. Mean the wound closure is moving towards the uh the center of the of the wound uh, center of the wound bed okay then uh, day 14 also is actually in comparison with the with the uh with the um control group okay and intraperitoneal it comes a week later at day 14 we start to witness some good progress yeah so intraperitoneal topical you can see that there's some difference uh topical actually uh, start to act faster than our inter, intraperitoneal group and both wounds uh, both both uh, treated be it uh, topical or intraperitoneal they all healed faster uh, by day 35 we cleared already they all healed where else for um, control group you can see that it linger around until even pod post-op day 50 post-op day 49 the wound are still not fully closed yet yeah so there is a uh, um, the closure time is actually longer in our control group when we study this using the PIC model. Okay, photographic wound assessment. Um, generally, uh, what we notice is that the topical, when we put the uh, topically apply, you can see that the uh, wound bait actually, the initial seven days was actually, uh, does uh, the, the higher the score, it shows, it reflects a, uh, reflect a slow healing. Yeah. So our topical were actually the slowest in healing in terms of the uh, the the uh, initial state. And why so? Um, appearance, like in terms of appearance, it's not about the healing rate, but it's talking about the uh, appearance. It's because uh, when we topically apply the stem cells on it, we see a lot of debris. We see a lot of like you know um, a lot of yellow debris because it's you're putting a foreign body onto the wound bed itself. So that actually we can see that there's a lot of you know uh, reaction, a lot of you know um, response towards this topical 
cells that's put onto the wound bed. So that sort of contributed to a uh, poorer score in our appearance, wound appearance. So uh, this wound appearance basically look at like, you know, whether there's any necrotic amount, like dead cells, debris, things like that. It's not really talking about the, uh, the size. The size itself is, uh, uh, there's no difference. It's basically we see that the wound bed looks that there is more necrotic amount on it so this is it but you can see that by day uh 14 day 21 that the topical is actually doing very well really so it uh, uh yeah it actually came down in terms of the scoring uh as i mentioned earlier the lower the scoring it shows uh, better wound progress and then the uh at pod 35 the wound appearance is still not so optimal for uh control whereas for topical and ip they have fully closed really mm. Okay, epitalization. So you can see this layer is epitalization. Actually, for topical, we see that you know, um, well, you look at when you look at it, uh, both topical and intraperitoneal do better than our control. But if you compare topical and intraperitoneal, the peri uh, the topical itself actually is, uh, in terms of the epitalization, it is, um, it shows better. Uh, result as compared to intraperitoneal. So our topical sort of ace and be the first in terms of you know, the epitalization. Yeah, so that is what we noticed in our study. Okay, um, even in terms of the edema and blood in the dermis layer, you can see the um, slow healing. The last row here is control group. You can see even at POD28 and uh, POD35, the histology show very loose tissues. It shows the edematous, like you know, it's swollen. The the and the red color, like those pink, pink, uh, pink region, is like you know, there are some blood deposits at that level. So it shows that inflammation is still in progress because inflammation is could be represented by edematous. So in our control group, that's why the healing goes slower because even at 28 and uh, POD 35, the tissues are still quite edematous, where else the uh, uh, treated animals, they are quite stable already. By the time it reaches like POD 14, means the recovery for topical and intraparietal is closer to uh, non-diabetic uh, animals. They actually heal quite well. Uh, yeah, uh, com uh, it's more comparable with a uh, normal uh, animal, normal non-diabetic animals. Okay, so uh, when we look at the um, TF, TNF, which is the uh, inflammatory markers, you can see that the control itself, they are quite consistently high in terms of the uh, inflammatory, which is what is known in diabetic uh, animals. They have like prolonged uh, inflammation, as I mentioned to you. So when I look at, when we look at the tissues for uh, inflammatory marker, it's, it, it reflects quite accurately that you know, uh, throughout, you can see that you know, there is actually quite a lot of uh, pro-inflammatory markers uh, existing and you know around compared to you know um, compared to the topical and the intraperitoneal uh, treated animals they have let they are more uh, they have less inflammation going on okay well for the anti-inflammation itself you can see that if you just look at this picture here uh, we see battle uh, anti-inflammatory which is IL-10 we see them more prominent in the intraperitoneal route the one that we use systemic administration yeah so they tend to have more effect in the uh, mechanism uh, so if you if i give a summary to it you can see that you know the topical itself do better in terms of the structure the tissue structure the epithelial seems to do uh, yeah the closure the epithelial it it's actually you know uh, the collagen in fact later when i show the collagen result you can also see that the topical are better at the structure thing whereas the intraperitoneal which is systemic seems to be having more influence in terms of the systemic thing, which is basically the uh, markers, the inflammatory and anti-inflammatory marker. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I mentioned to you, inflammation at the first seven days is quite common in all wounds. Yeah, and um, but by uh, POD 7, POD uh, 7, uh, 14, 21, we would expect the inflammation to go down. And this is time that you, know, you can see that the anti-inflammation is quite high in our orange bar here which is basically the intraperitoneal so the intraperitoneal actually do quite well in terms of you know uh, um, um, suppressing because when you have this anti-inflammatory io tent present in the in the system you can see that the inflammation would be suppressed because of your io tent's presence it basically like you know switch off the pro-inflammatory okay so this is what i mentioned about uh yeah both be 
uh, topical or intraperitoneal, they do better than our experiment group in terms of the uh, collagen fibers. Okay, the uh, we measure two things. Uh, one thing is that we measure the fiber diameter. Okay, to uh, indicate the you know the uh, larger the diameter, it shows a better quality collagen. We also look at the arrangement of the collagen, more organized compared to a less organized uh, structure. Okay, so for collagen fibers, just the diameter itself, you can see that you know the highest is actually the uh, animal that receive the colony MSC through topical route. Yes, yeah, that's why I the sensing is that you know the topical application seems to be very good for structural uh, improvement. The epithelizing, uh, the epithelial tissue seems to form more quickly. And then the um the um diameter of the collagen also seems to be you know stronger. And when we look at it actually the arrangement is more organized as well com as compared to you know control. You look at the control which is actually the last a column here they look very scattered when you compare with the topical it is actually more organized more organized in my uh, topical okay and very scattered in my control so control is actually the uh, the last column here you can see that you no know, the collagen all this little little dot here when we use tm to see it it seems to be very scattered still fibry and this one is actually very form ready yeah so that's what we noticed in our study and the best performer here would be the pigs that receive cord lining MSC through topical route. Okay, so uh, I'm close to the end of my presentation. I just wanted to re uh, reinforce again some of the key learning points. Okay, uh, so we see that topical treated pigs demonstrate advancement earlier at uh, from day uh, 14 onwards. We start to see quite obvious uh, uh, acceleration as compared to the uh, control group. Okay, for IP comes a bit later, uh, we start to see improvement or significant improvement from day 21 onwards. That's what we uh, found out from this study. The second thing we see is that the inflammatory marker uh, seems to be consistently high in control group, which um, mimic over the diabetic model. Uh, diabetic wounds, they are always very high inflammatory. They always revolve around the inflammation state. Okay, where else the TNF... Um, when compared with, uh, yeah, uh, is uh, the TNF is actually uh, consistently high in the diabetic group, and as compared to those that uh, receive colony MSC, be it topical or be it, um, be it through the intraperitoneum. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, this is the third point that we see is that the anti-inflammatory marker, which is actually the IL-10, is intensified at crucial point, POD 7, POD 14, POD 21, POD 28. So when you when the uh, anti-inflammatory marker is high, you it will help to suppress and help, help to you know prevent the pro-inflammatory marker. So the IL-10, which is actually quite known, even in a lot of in vitro study, which it shows that uh, CLMSC can secrete the uh, IL-10 quite uh, proficiently. Yeah, so when the anti-inflammatory marker is high, you will naturally see a lower intensity in terms of the pro-inflammatory yep so that's what we realized the thing that we see in our study the fourth thing as i mentioned is the collagen and collagen is actually important because of uh, prevent the recurrence you know keep repeating the in the clinical side you will see patient keep coming keep coming back to you because of wound breakdown okay so that is actually quite important to, uh, to us as well so we do see as i mentioned earlier there is more collagen fiber the di diameter of the collagen fiber or um, uh, 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 higher in CLMSC treated group. Yep. Okay. So that is the density is more, and also the diameter is uh, larger. As, uh, the, is basically be, uh, larger as well for the CLMSC topical, specifically the topical. So the anti-inflammatory marker is more prominent in the intraperitoneal uh, CLMSC delivered through intraperitoneal uh, collagen structure. The first performer tends to be the uh, the animal that uh, receive the CLMSC through topical route. Okay, so what we are doing in clinical now, in clinical itself, uh, because uh, cord lining MSC is still not, uh, um, not, um, not FDA approved at the moment, but we started to use the exosomes to actually uh, act as fertilizer. So you can see that for this plant to grow, okay, it's not necessary uh, applying it at the at the at the plant itself we actually apply it at the surrounding tissues uh, what we notice in our study is that um, or when we read the literature we notice that actually when you apply the stem cells onto the wound bed itself 
because of the wound bed environment, the wound bed environment is actually very, uh, it can be, you know, a very, um, the pH structure is different. There's a lot of toxin, there's a lot of, you know, uh, inflammatory exudates there, you know. So the environment is not very, uh, it does not receive the MSC very well. Some, uh, yeah, that's what we realized in a lot of articles. Lah. So when you apply it directly onto here, onto the wound bed itself, because of the environment being like a war zone, yeah, there's a lot of uh, inflammatory marker, anti-inflammatory marker trying to have a role at the wound healing site and therefore sometimes the penetration of your uh, MSC would be compromised yeah so we um, uh, how we resolve this is that for clinical now we put it at the surrounding we put it at the healthy skin because we believe that the penetration would be uh, would be more successful yeah uh, and also because we cannot uh, we don't uh, we we uh, uh, we don't put onto the wound bed at this moment because of the um, FDA. We haven't actually received the FDA, but we put it on healthy skin. It is actually possible. Yeah. So this is one example uh, uh, by Dr. Francis uh, at Sengkang Hospital. So you see, we apply the uh, exosomes of the stem cells because the stem cell is not FDA approved yet, right? So we use the exosomes and we put it at the surrounding tissue here. Yeah. So progressively, we see that this wound itself actually there's very high risk for amputation, but it actually heal up. Yeah. It actually healed up uh, within, I think, uh, was three weeks. Yeah, so it is an interval of about three weeks. So when we first see the patient, week one, week two, week three, it actually healed up quite well. So uh, we're starting to see some progress, uh, some promising result in the when it's being translated into clinical. Yeah, so this is another wound. We also in um, yep, uh, we take the picture on a weekly basis. So this is when we first see and yep, when we apply onto the surrounding tissue. Yep. And then um, I think this one is about three weeks. Yeah, two, three weeks, the wound actually close up. Yeah, this is actually a, a, a minor amputation really. So so there is, uh, so this is what we do in clinical at this point of time. Uh, we manage to actually, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I personally have seen one that's basically three years old. Uh, that wound itself had been there for three years. Yeah, so we managed to close it within three months using the colony MSC. So that's, uh, that is not in Sengah Hospital, but it's actually a case that we see at patients' home. Yep. So I think this is the last slide I have. Uh, is it okay if I stop sharing now? Let me just... Thank you, Dr. Lim, um, for a very detailed and elaborate presentation. Perhaps we'll move on to our Q&A section. So we have a question in the chat. How should the stem cell topical application be administered? Is it combined with normal saline or other types of solutions? Additionally, how can we verify the viability of MSCs after the treatment? Okay, for clinical, I, I suppose the question is actually targeting clinical. Okay, in clinical itself, uh, we do not add the, what's it called? We basically just take the exosomes of wholesale and we did not uh, dilute it in any normal saline. I think that's the first part of the question, right? Asking whether the uh, the exosomes is uh, diluted in any, uh, yep, uh, the answer is no. We basically just take the exosomes and then just uh, just uh, massage it over the surrounding, the peri wound region. Yeah, so that's what we did for the clinical side. Uh, Aisha, would you mind to repeat the second part of the question, please? No worries. Okay, so the second part is that, additionally, how can we verify the viability of MSCs after the treatment? Mm, yeah, um, we actually didn't, uh, uh, we applied in experiment itself, when we did the experiment, in uh, we actually checked the viability, uh, count the cells presence, before we apply onto the wound, not in clinical. In clinical is uh, uh, not quite uh, yeah, uh, not quite practical for us to bring the you know uh, to the clinical side. So uh, so, but the viability is checked uh, before we actually how uh, the, we did a very quick uh, a rough cell count before we apply onto the wound uh, for the experiment itself. So that is to uh, yeah to check the viability of the of the cells. Mm. Next question, uh, which criteria should we consider when determining the number of cells to inject? Does it depend on weight or the size of the wound? We use size to, of the wound and we use the fibroblasts as uh, a bed bench, uh, as a base for us to estimate. So uh, let me just uh, share my, my screen. There is a, a, yep, so one centimeter, if I remember correctly, just let me just check my 
so you basically the answer is that we go by the size of the wound um you give me a minute nah. so it's basically um one million cells per uh per centimeter yeah so that is the yeah so uh and the the, the what's that called uh this why is it one million cells is based on the fibroblast presence of fibroblast in the tissue yeah so it's not the cell size we use the wound area to decide how much uh stem cells to put in yeah so it's one million per one centimeter so for the peak um, wound model it is basically uh, 5 times 5 is 25 right so 25 centimeter and we do a calculation on the 25 uh, centimeter cells about how much stem cells are then put onto the wound bed based on the one centimeter per square feet kind of measurement yep and as I mentioned earlier is based on the fibroblast presence uh, yep in which the next question is how is the survival of stem cells with time Just sorry how is the survival of stem cells with time uh, unfortunately in our study we didn't uh, in the pig study itself we didn't uh, measure how long the stem cells stay on the wound bed but we have other studies that actually uh, basically just look at the survival and is basically within 14 days all the stem cells are off they are no they are not uh, they are not present we don't see the um presence of stem cells on the animal we couldn't do that for pig because the uh in the lab that we use or at the moment in terms of you know uh the scan that actually look at the uh survival of the cells right the mice can go through the scanner but not the pig the pig is too big to go through the scanner so we couldn't uh measure how long the uh, stem cell stays in the in the uh, tissue presence remain in the tissue but use literature and use the mice we did actually scan through the scanner and see how long it lasts it was about uh, not more than 14 days by 14 days we don't see any more stem cells after uh, being applied onto it yeah because for our study we put stem cells every week yeah and uh, as soon as the wound um, closed we actually euthanized the animal already so we we did not we did not do the part to actually you know uh, uh, monitor for one more two weeks to see whether the presence of stem cells still remain there but we have a separate study to study the mice to determine the stem cells was remain in the mice for how long and the result shows uh, 7 to 14 days mm. Yeah, and the next question is, um, what is the rationale to introduce stem cells intraperitoneally for a skin wound? Mm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the translation, we were more hopeful for the topical application. Yeah, intraperitoneal is basically a, a junk experiment to show that, you know, even when we inject the stem cells into the system itself, uh, not topical, just into the system, none of the animal actually uh, died because of that yeah so um uh, so it's basically more to indicate the safety aspect of it yeah and um yeah we try why intraperitoneal and not intravenous yeah and why not intravenous the uh, we tried intravenous and intravenous because stem cells itself is not is obtained from tissues right because we obtain it from the cord lining it's actually a tissue cells is not the uh, not the uh, blood cells so when we inject into into um, the vessel of one pig the pig died immediately because it clot up and then it basically caused a heart attack for the for the pig yeah so with that we modified and we change it to intraperitoneal not into the blood system but intraperitoneal when we discussed with the vet we decided to put the cells into the peritoneal region and not into the vessel because the vessel cause um cause cardiac arrest for the animal because it is actually a soft tissue cells and not uh hemato it's not a blood cells yeah so it was not compatible when we put into the vessel yeah we can only put it into the body system through the peritoneal mm. thank you dr lim for answering all the questions um, at this point of time, I don't see any further questions from the audience. So perhaps we will wrap up our session. On behalf of Actress, thank you very much, Dr. Lim, for the enlightening presentation. And to all our audience, thank you for attending today's lecture. Have a very good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>